Hello and welcome to another edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show on your home for SKC Soccer, Sports Radio 810 WHB, wherever you stream your video content, namely Facebook Live, and uh, wherever you get your podcasts as well. We appreciate you watching and listening to the show. As always, my name is Nate Bucati. We are brought to you by Michelob Ultra, and we are joined as always by Ali Trost in her hipster mid uh, crossroads apartment. And Carter Augustine in front of a scarf wall, but it's not his own scarf wall this time around. Where are we today, Carter? That's right. I'm at uh, Compass Minerals National Performance Center here, uh, the place formerly known as Pinnacle, um, but the, the training center for Sporting KC. And it's down in my, down in our little editing, uh, editing basement dungeon studio. So um, just hiding myself away from everyone in a socially responsible manner. It's a, it's a pretty cool flex, uh, Allie, that Carter gets to do by doing the show from inside Compass Minerals because that means he is tier one. He is a tier one member that is embedded with the team and, uh, and has access to training and things. But that also means, Carter, that you've got to be extra careful, right? Because you're part of the uh, – you're part of tier one, I guess, is what that means. There's, there's different tiers of people that have access to the different teams in MLS and the protocols. So, so what is life like back in Kansas City for you now that you've been here for a little bit? Yeah, it's very similar to kind of the month leading up to departure for Orlando and got a chance to talk to Peter Vermees last week about the restart and people's questions about uh, the bubbles and everything. And he kind of, he said it's, it's almost like a mini bubble for each player and each person that's involved in the tier one status and that. Um, when you're not coming to training, you have to be very disciplined in knowing uh, everyone that you come in contact with, uh, what, what they have been doing, and make sure that they are not uh, coming in, in any danger of, of getting in these, these places where perhaps it's a higher risk for coronavirus. So um, still a little bit isolated. Um, obviously, could still go to the grocery store in, in a responsible way, way, wear a mask, washing the hands and everything, but just got to be um, just got to be pragmatic and, and have to keep in mind that, yeah, it's still kind of, kind of in a bubble, really, you know, and um, I think it's something that the team took very seriously leading into the tournament, and I think they'll continue to, to take it pretty seriously because you don't want to be the, the one person that kind of, you know, brings it into um, to, the, to the rest of the team and, and, and get people infected, so... Um, yeah, it's a, it's a, it's a big responsibility, but um, like you said, it comes with the ability to watch training and, and stuff like that. So it's, it's a decent trade-off. So uh, coming up on the show, we are going to talk with a couple of really good guests. We got a lot of news for you. We've got the rollout of the first phase of whatever we're going to call this version of the MLS regular season. We'll get to the details on that. Some of the details we're going to hear from Jake Reed, the president of Sporting Kansas City about their plans to have a very limited number of fans in the stands for these games coming up, starting with that home game on August 28th. We're going to hear from Sam Stagecolt of The Athletic, who has just done an absolutely phenomenal job. I, I feel like he knows what's happening in the league before the league knows what's happening sometimes. And we're going to talk with him about uh, the plans going forward and also just other thoughts around the league. And we're going to be joined by veteran Roger Espinoza on the show as well. Now, I'll tell you, we are recording the show on a Tuesday before the MLS is back tournament championship game, which is this evening about the same time. This will be airing live on sports radio 810. So we're not going to give you any updates on that game necessarily, but we'll have some thoughts on the wrapping up of that tournament and competition as well. All coming up straight ahead guys, but let's jump right into the fact that major league soccer, this is more important for our fans for sporting Kansas city, because we know they're, they're running the MLS is back tournament has uh, come to a close. The restart to the regular season has been announced. Phase one by Major League Soccer has been announced. Now, they have said that the goal is to play an 18-game regular season in addition to the five games that have already been played by clubs like Sporting Kansas City, or some clubs have to make up games like Nashville and FC Dallas as well because they didn't get their group stage games in down in the uh, MLS's back tournament. But for Sporting Kansas City, we know the first six games back, and they are in the region. This is going to feel very U.S. Open Cup-ish because it's the teams we see all the time in these competitions. Going to help us on a preparation standpoint for the broadcast, by the way, though, because we've already <laughs> seen these teams. 
Coming up on Friday, August 21st, that's the first game back at Minnesota United. That game will be at 6.30 Central Time on Friday evening. Then the home opener, reopener, whatever we want to call it, the home game, the first home game back will be um, on Tuesday, August 25th against the Houston Dynamo at 7.30. Then the following Saturday, August 29th at the Colorado Rapids, 8 o'clock on, uh, uh, out in Denver. Then the following Wednesday, September 2nd, against FC Dallas at home. The following Saturday, September 5th, at the Houston Dynamo, 7 o'clock. And then a week later, on Sunday the 13th, against Minnesota United. So we're talking about six games in a short period of time, guys. And that schedule congestion, you're trying to get 18 games in before early November comes to a close. Um, the depth of the teams is going to be tested. Allie, what did you make of uh, these first six games that we see on the schedule for Sporting Kansas City now? Yeah, well, first, I, I really like the approach that Major League Soccer is taking with the phases. I think that that's really smart and just reassessing after each phase what's working, what's not working, how to better uh, prepare for that next phase. And I think that that's something in hindsight you would have maybe liked to see Major League Baseball do because it kind of helps you keep things a bit more organized and in your, you can just focus on one set of games and you have a start and an end date to that. Um, you bring up the congested schedule, though, and that is definitely a concern, especially with the on-again, off-again preparation time that these players have had with the, the weird preseason, preseason again, and then preseason again. Um, that, you know, like you said, Nate, depth is going to be tested. Uh, short turnaround time leads to injuries that can keep players out. Hopefully, you know, nothing too severe for especially sporting Kansas City, but that's definitely a concern. Um, the schedule, yeah, you know, you'd like to see sporting maybe not play the same teams that I feel like we see them play all the time. But uh, as we'll hear later in the show, the players just want to play. Roger Espinosa saying, you know, that, hey, it's a game and we're ready to go. So I think it's it's really exciting, and again, I just I really, really think that the phased approach is is a really smart move for Major League Soccer. I agree on that on that alley with the uh, it's a it's a good approach from MLS with the phases, uh, and yeah, it's a little bit of a, a bummer to to play some teams that Sporting has already played. I mean, uh, Colorado, Minnesota were were in the group with Sporting down there in Orlando, but that actually might add a little bit of spice to those two games. And uh, I'm looking forward to the opener against Minnesota because I think sporting has a bitter taste in their mouth from that game. It might've been that first hour might've been the best soccer they played in Orlando. Um, I mean, they, they were picking around pretty well there until Tim Mealy got sent off. So, well, uh, and not to mention too, Minnesota will have some key players back that they were yeah. missing. Uh, in that game, especially Luis Amaria didn't play. Aiko Parra, I, I'm not sure if he will be back because I know he didn't go to the tournament because of he was rehabbing an injury. But, I mean, that could be another player too and an old friend of sporting. Perhaps Ozzy Alonso, who also missed yeah. out. You're yeah. Right. So it'll, be, it'll have different dynamics. Sporting, I think, will want to avenge that loss that they uh, kind of gave away there in the after the 90th minute, two goals. So I know that that stuck with the players for some time. And then on the flip side, Colorado will be feeling so hard done by from uh, – I know they had a lot of complaints about the referee in, in that game in Orlando. So you got to think that yeah. they'll, be, they'll be fired up as well. So I don't know. What, what, what do you think, Nate? Maybe some, some interesting um, matchups with, with those two teams. It's been a Houston team that's sporting waxed in, in the <laughs> 52, 52 years ago. Yeah. So – well, the first things first, I'm with you guys. When it comes to anything sports-related in today's world, I, I say beggars can't be choosers. And if you got a game for me, I'm, I'm excited. I don't really care what the matchup is. I, I'm not going to complain about any matchups. Um, I'm just happy that we have a chance to have some regular season soccer. And selfishly, the thing that I'm most excited about is I read down those three schedules. I see the TV schedule right next to it. And every single one of them on Fox Sports Kansas City or Fox Sports Kansas City Plus, which means we get a broadcast. We weren't allowed to broadcast these uh, games down at the MLS's back tournament on television. Um, we obviously got to call them on radio, which was still a lot of fun, but uh, getting the whole band back together and getting a chance to, to own our broadcasts again, uh, I'm very excited about right there. So plug, make sure you watch us if you're, if you're not going to the games. When it comes to these matchups, I think what we saw from Colorado and Minnesota, first of all, I think you take everything that happened in Orlando with a grain of salt. That was just a wacky competition with wacky results. I also think that's what happens when you get teams together that really know each other's tendencies well. There's that familiarity there. 
there is going to be cagey affairs. First of all, there's going to be some bad blood between guys. I think you're going to see things get chippy because guys have memories about what happened in previous games. That can make for entertaining soccer too, though, and I think it can also make for an interesting uh, chess match and cat and mouse game of what types of adjustments does each team try to make. Kind of like I know you're a big NBA guy, Carter, and when you watch those NBA playoff series and, and you see one game and you think, wow, that team looked way better. Uh, they're going to just cruise in this series. And then all of a sudden the second game looks completely different and you're not exactly sure why. But these teams are going to make adjustments when they see each other. They all know each other well. They're going to see each other multiple times in a short period of time, which I think can, it can make for some interesting uh, you know, chess match type situations there as well. Well, Nate, One of the, I just ahead. wanted to yeah. add, though, especially when you look at how difficult goals are to come by in Major League Soccer, I think offensively it's going to require teams to get really creative. If in that game prep process teams are better – uh, prepared to shut down an Alan Polito, which I don't know if that's possible because what we've seen so far uh, doesn't make it seem like it is. But I also just think that when you when you play a team enough times, you kind of know uh, where their weaknesses are or where their strengths are and how to better better contain them. Well, perfect example of the Colorado game, right? The, I mean, the Sporting KC coaching staff talked about how the game plan where the Rapids came out with in the first half was very, very good. And they said it worked pretty well. Then they counterpunched during the game with a couple adjustments of their own. Mm -hmm. and, and those worked. Obviously, the, the, the sending off will have a huge effect on the game. But then, yeah, exactly, Ali, what, what does Colorado do now coming back out of that one, having just seen sporting and they, their game plans? Yeah, I'm really, I'm really fascinated to see how all that stuff uh, works out. One thing I think works well for Sporting Kansas City, and we should mention in terms of getting players back, by all accounts, uh, and, and his own account, it appears that Kyrie Shelton, should be back for this competition. I think we saw uh, what he meant to the team when he was playing in Orlando and then when he was out, uh, that, that he was sorely missed for Sporting Kansas City as well. But with SKC, th there are so many attacking options that I think there's going to be that pick your poison. And then it's about mm -hmm. whether or not Sporting Kansas City can adjust to whichever guy or guys the other team is trying to take away because I think that's going to be difficult to take all the options away for Sporting Kansas City through the course of, of any one game. Now, one of the things we know is, is going to be a feature when Sporting Kansas City plays at home as well is a, a certain number of fans in the stands, a limited number. They announced that about 14% of capacity they're going to allow in the stadium. Uh, President Jake Reed for Sporting Kansas City addressed the media. There are a lot of questions about that. So I want to play a couple of clips for you so you can hear from Jake Reed uh, how they came to that decision and where they plan to go as the season goes on. So first off, here is Jake Reed talking about the decision – to, to go with the percentage of, of people in the stands that they ended up settling on? We could actually do more capacity than we are, are going to roll out. Uh, we just feel like being conservative and, and making sure that we're taking the safest approach possible has been our um, go-to throughout this process. And certainly the last thing we want to do is, is come out um, you know, larger than we need to. So I, I think starting small and then uh, getting our arms wrapped around the process and then, you know, at, at some point building from there makes sense. But for the first three games, we'll be set at uh, kind of that 14% capacity, which which that's out to ballpark 2,500 folks uh, in the venue. Okay, so there's Jake Reed on the situation in terms of the number of fans in the stands and how they'll try to space them out and make sure that everything is safe in terms of protocols there. He also went on at this news conference on Monday to list out some of the protocols that will be in place to try to keep everybody as safe as possible, which is obviously the number one priority. To go through a couple of them, and we, we're, we've got, um, you're going to be temp checked on the way in. We've got um, social distancing in place. We've re-envisioned the entire um, flow of the stadium. We've got all concessions and retail open, which again, for 2,500 fans is complete overkill, but we wanted to spread it out and, and ensure that there was not kind of a log jam at, at one or two areas. We've gone completely um, you know, touchless on payment uh, process at all point of sales. We've we've redone how the, the food uh, will be served. So, um, again, following the guidelines that's been put forth by the, the people that are a lot smarter than me in the medical um, world that have, have been driving this um, and requiring masks as well. I think that's been uh, clearly the biggest driver from um, the government here lately. And so um, no different than if you're out at a restaurant, you've got to have a mask on at all times unless you're eating and drinking. And, and that's something that we'll uh, you know, we're going to keep a close eye on to ensure that fans are complying because we think that's the most important. That is President Jake Reed for Sporting Kansas City. And of course, again, that home opener for SKC will be on Tuesday, August 25th against the Houston Dynamo.
deja vu a little bit. That was the home opener uh, way back at the beginning of the season in March. Now it's going to be the home reopener at the end of August. And hopefully we get this thing 18 games in all the way into the playoffs. Sporting Kansas City, our first place in the West going into that stretch. We're going to go ahead and take a break. When we come back, we're going to have Sam Stagecoe from The Athletic to join us and answer many more of these questions we have about what lies ahead for Sporting Kansas City and Major League Soccer. This is the Sporting Kansas City Show on uh, Sports Radio 810 WHB, presented by Michelob Ultra. And the Sporting Kansas City Show continues, presented by Michelob Ultra. Find your fit as we are on Sports Radio 810 WHB. We are streaming, of course, on all of the video uh, platforms you can imagine, including Facebook and all of the podcast venues that you could imagine as well. However you consume the show, we really appreciate it. And we have a lot to get to now with our next guest, Sam Stagecole, who has basically broken every MLS-related story, starting with the MLS's back through today. And so we're going to have him recap every single one of those stories now. I'm just kidding. We have a lot, though, to get to. Sam, how are you, man? I'm doing well. I'm not sure I deserve all that praise, but thank you for having me on and thank you for it all the same. <laughs> it, it, it's, it's been, well, I mean, what's this experience been like for you? Uh, we were talking to you before we went on the air. You, you've been there in Brooklyn, kind of locked down like, like everybody has been, but particularly in New York. Yet, has there ever been a, a crazier time for you in terms of breaking news and, and all the stuff that you've been involved in over the last four months? I don't think so. You know, in some ways, it's just sort of been normal life, but like ratcheted it up, at least from the work perspective, um, you know, because I work from home all the time. And I spend my day writing and making phone calls. So that hasn't changed at all. It's just maybe I'm writing more and making more phone calls now. Um, and then, of course, watching what 50, 50 games, 51 tonight um, yeah. with the, with MLS is back. Um, so yeah, it's been busy, but but thankful to, uh, to be employed and to be healthy and, and to be able to talk about soccer. It's not so bad, you know. Sam, speaking of all of those games, the mm -hmm. MLS is back tournament ends after what seems like a blink of an eye to me. Maybe Carter was down there, so it may not feel like that to him. What did you make <laughs> of uh, this entire experience and what Major League Soccer was able to pull off just from all the information that you know and the coverage that you've just been so uh, in on this entire thing? Yeah, so I think it's been, on the whole, pretty positive. Um, you know, obviously, the, there was spread within the team for Dallas and within the team for Nashville, and that was not positive, right? And I think there were some mistakes made there. Um, I don't think uh, it's unnatural that mistakes were made. Nobody has a blueprint for this. Nobody really knows exactly what to do. Maybe some things were a little bit preventable. In hindsight, right, it's easy to say that. Um, I do think any honest accounting of the tournament needs to lead with the fact that two teams were withdrawn before they could play a game though. Um, it's positive that it didn't spread to anyone else um, and that MLS was able to pull this off safely for the most part. Um, that's great. Uh, in terms of what we saw on the field, I think, you know, pretty much consensus opinion, right? The beginning was a little bit rough as guys were large as we've gone on. Um, and I think Portland and Orlando are two pretty deserving finalists on balance based on uh, how they've played throughout the entire tournament. Well, first, Sam, I want to ask uh, that the picture of the trophy was finally released uh, over the past couple of days. What are, your, what are your thoughts on that? Yeah, yeah, it's a good trophy. I am curious. You know, hopefully this one is never defended, right? Like, that's what we're hoping <laughs> for. This is a one-off. So, like, whoever wins it, that's a pretty cool one to have. That's a pretty cool novelty item. Um, so I'd be, I'd be pretty excited about that if I was a fan of the winning club. So trophy better than the name of the competition? Yeah, I didn't hate the name. A lot of people bagged on the name. You don't have to explain it at all. That's it's right true. there in the name. MLS is back, right? So, um, I just I just am curious what they're going to call the remainder of it, right? The, the uh, MLS is the right back season. again, you know, just MLS like, is uh, back again. MLS still here. MLS is back is back. Um, see, I, I like... I like the back again because I feel like you can throw some Backstreet Boys. Like, I want them to take this yeah. like, early 2000s pop approach to all of their social campaigns <laughs> and every marketing tactic that they, that they use. Or like since, this, since this was the MLS's back tournament, this could be the MLS's back season. Um, you know, just change the suffix at the very end of it. But in all, to go back to what you said, though, Sam, about hopefully this is a one-off and this is the only trophy, there has been talk that, hey, maybe this would be a really cool way to kick off the MLS season every year. Why not do it? MLS is already kind of a unique animal in the world of soccer, and this could be something else that sets it apart. Do I take this to mean you're, you're against that idea, or, or do you think there's any legs to that idea, 
of starting off the regular season with some sort of competition like this? I'm not necessarily against it. I think MLS kind of already has it, though, right, in the League's Cup, with, which is this tournament with Liga MX. Mm -hmm. And I think if you're going to see a competition like this return, it's going to be with Liga MX, and that already exists. So, like, everyone's saying, well, wouldn't this be cool? Well, like, it already happens. It's in the middle of the season. It's not at the beginning of the year, so that would be a little bit different, right? Um, you could theoretically change the timing if you wanted to, and if everyone in Mexico and here in the States and Canada got, got on board with that. Um, so I, I kind of struggle to see how you would fit it in. I don't think clubs and owners are going to want to give up game day revenue. So I think if you were to do a tournament like this, it would have to be in home cities. Um, so that's sort of my overall take. Uh, I don't think you're, you're going to see it as, in a situation where it's like a bubble and you're doing the desert diamond cup in Tucson, but just like blowing it out. Right. Um, like, I think, I think if it was to happen, it would be in home markets and, I don't know. I, I don't really see that. I think the league will just continue to kind of shift emphasis towards the league's cup, that competition it has with Mexico. Well, and I feel like too, a lot of people, because it is the only MLS thing going on, there's that excitement. We should do this again. And it's like, well, is that, you know, is realistic. It's maybe just more of the excitement around it. But as we mentioned now, the MLS season continues on They are the bubble is going to be popped and Major League Soccer will be exposed to all of the risks that come with traveling, uh, playing at home stadiums, letting fans in. I was on the call with Commissioner Don Garber, um, and I, you've been on, on top of all of this. You know, what did you make of some of uh, his uh, answers during that call to a lot of questions about player safety and, and how Major League Soccer can really be sure that they are completely minimizing the risk or maybe not going to run in, into the same problems that Major League Baseball did? Yeah, I mean, well, you have to trust the players, first and foremost, and the staff members that are going to be traveling as well, right? Um, it come, At the very end of the day, it comes down to that. Um, but I think the main thing is there is risk, no matter how you slice it. You know, I was talking to some of the Dallas players um, just the other day, and they mentioned to me, you know, they had some positive tests before they got to Orlando. And they mentioned to me that those guys that were testing positive, young homegrown players who are living at home with mom and dad and brother and sister, right? And those people are going to work and those people are going to school and maybe they're bringing it home and the Dallas player who maybe hasn't left his home, but to go to training can still pick it up that way. Right. So there are going to be risks here. Um, and there are going to be guys I'm sure that test positive, right? We, this virus isn't really going anywhere. Um, so it's, how does the league handle that? Um, are they able to kind of lock it down in the cases isolated so they don't spread throughout a team like we've seen in Major League Baseball, and like we saw with Dallas and with Nashville, um, I don't know. Um, you know, that's going to be a tall task. A lot of it's going to be outside of their control. Um, so it's going to be really interesting to see. I mean, I, I'm expecting some inevitable postponements, maybe some cancellations. Um, and then there's the whole added layer of uh, having fans in the stands, which you guys are obviously familiar with again to say. Uh, Sam, do you think, just going back to, you know, talk when Ali asked about the uh, – perhaps redoing this tournament at some point in time. Um, if that doesn't happen, is there anything you think the league has learned from uh, this tournament and kind of what they've done down here with all the teams present that, that we might see take place in the future or that they'll, they'll use in the future? Um, I don't know. That's an interesting question. Um, I'm sure there are many things that the league has learned, right? This is the first time they're ever doing something like this. So anytime that's the case, you learn a lot of things. Um, I think maybe – Maybe there's a shift in the relationship between the league and the union, perhaps. Um, you know, obviously the players were involved in a lot of this. I think a lot of them kind of have found their voice on a lot of these matters. Um, so maybe that relationship changes a little bit. Um, I don't think it really changed over the course of like the actual negotiations that happened before the tournament. Um, but maybe in the future, there's kind of a reckoning there. Um, maybe a shift in the balance of power or maybe players are just more involved now. Um, so that could be a change that comes out of this. Um, it's going to be interesting to see, too, just kind of how the league emphasizes certain things going forward. Um, you know, even how they communicate to clubs, right? Are they communicating to the business officers or to the soccer officers, right? On a thing like the schedule, for instance, a lot of that communication was going through the business side, which isn't wrong, but it wasn't going through the soccer side, which, in my opinion, seems like you should probably be going through both, right? Um, so it's going to be interesting to see kind of how that unfolds going forward and what those relationships are like. Um, but yeah, I mean, I think the overall hope is that they don't have to go do this bubble again. Um, but who knows? I think if there's anything we've all learned in 2020, it's never say never, right? 
Yeah, I would say those are fascinating points. Uh, specifically broadcast, did you enjoy how, how the broadcasts went and um, maybe camera angles, something like, like that? Do you think maybe we could see in the future? Yeah, I think the, the main thing for me from the broadcast is the audio of the VAR. I think that's awesome. I think yeah. that's been kind of universal. Um, that everyone's loved that. I hope that continues going forward. I think that could be a really cool thing that MLS does that I'm not sure any other league in the world is doing. Um, so that'd be a cool way to kind of be a leader in the sport. Um, as far as the other elements of the broadcasts, um, you know, I'm kind of of the opinion, I like the no crowd noise added in. Um, I like to be able to hear the yelling um, and the kind of chatter back and forth between players and coaches. Um, but I understand that the crowd noise has a nice element too. It is gonna be interesting. I've heard that some teams are going to be piping in crowd noise actually in the stadium so that the players and coaches will be able to hear it once the season sort of resumes. Um, I actually heard Kansas City might be one of those, but we'll see. I don't know if I've ever waffled on a, on a controversial topic more than I have on the crowd noise thing. Like one week <laughs> I'm, I'm pro crowd noise, the next week I'm against it. I like the, the audio. But one thing I do believe strongly in is if they're going to do crowd noise, do it in the stadium. Let the, let the players hear it. You know, let it fill up the actual stadium itself and not just what you're hearing at home. We'll see how that goes out. Once again, we're visiting with Sam Stagecole, and, and he does a tremendous job breaking down MLS soccer, particularly for the athletic. And you actually broke news on a trade that should be coming down the pike here. We're recording this on a Tuesday. The secondary transfer window opens on, uh, on tomorrow, on Wednesday. And you had Alex Muell should be getting traded to uh, Nashville in this situation. All right, so Sam, I'm, I'm curious, do you think this is going to be an active transfer market or with all of the uncertainty that you just mentioned in terms of we don't really know what, what the future holds in 2020, will teams kind of sit back and be a little quieter? What, what's your read on what things will be like for the clubs here uh, going into this transfer window? Um, you know, I would need to go back and look at the volume of moves in the summer window in particular from past years. I don't think it's, it's usually not that active of a window in general in MLS. Um, I think this window will probably be pretty similar in all honesty, um, to past years. I don't think there's going to be a huge change. There probably will be some discounts available, um, particularly out of Mexico. That's one spot that I've been hearing of of teams that have been looking to sell. So if teams want to go get a player, maybe that's a good place to go. You know, we've seen Miami connected with Blaise Matuidi from Juventus. It looks like he's going to be signed. Um, the Red Bulls have made a couple of significant money moves already, even if we don't really know who those players are. <laughs> um, but, you know, added a DP earlier this window um, in addition to the trade. So, you know, I think, I think it'll probably be pretty similar. I think there are going to be some interesting moves available. Uh, from a financial perspective. Um, so excited to see how that plays out, to be totally honest, because it is going to be different. Um, COVID is definitely affecting uh, the market and, and how all of this works. Well, hey, Sam, we really appreciate the time. Those of you that are watching can see who our next guest is about to be yeah. as Roger Espinoza is joining us. So we're going to take a break real quick and, and, and have Roger. Sam, thanks a lot for the time. We really appreciate it. To keep up the great work. Thanks so much for having me on, you guys. Thanks, There's Sam. Sam Stage Cold. You can check out all his stuff at The Athletic. We'll take a break and we'll have Lucky Lefty, Roger Espinoza, with us next on the Sporting Kansas City Show. And the Sporting Kansas City Show continues on Sports Radio 810 WHB, wherever you get your podcasts, wherever you stream your video content. Our thanks to Michelob Ultra for sponsoring our Sporting Kansas City coverage as always. And our thanks to Sam Stage Cold for joining us in the last segment. And now we're happy to talk to one of the veterans for Sporting Kansas City, Roger Espinoza. And, and we recognize this backdrop because back during the initial lockdown, when we were doing these interviews, uh, we were talking to guys from their home base. And Roger, it looks like you're back home in your Westport apartment. Is that right? How are you, man? I'm happy to be back. Thank you for having me on the show again. Uh, a little different now because we're able to get a little more freedom in this world, but um still hopefully uh, it gets better roger so, uh, oh, i was just gonna say being back home a fan favorite is chulo we have to know what was the reunion like oh it was great he was excited so <laughs> so was i um uh but yeah he's still doing great doing well uh was able to take it to the groomer right after the trip so it was good that's awesome anything else in uh in kansas city that you missed while you were gone that you're uh, excited to to be back for uh, 
I mean, just the facilities and being able to be at home and all that uh, in my own bed. Uh, but definitely being at the facilities, that's pretty much what we do here uh, as a soccer player. There's not much you can do other than, you know, just, uh, you know, be at the facility most of the day. And so you miss that because, uh, as you know, we have probably the best facility uh, in the United States. So that's always great being there and playing our own field. Um, very nice feels for our body. So uh, able to recover quicker. So you definitely miss that part. What about driving? Driving too. Uh, you know, driving is kind of like a little uh, uh, mentally helps you. You know, it help, it relaxes me when I go from from uh, uh, home to the field or even just driving around. Uh, it feels great, and you know, having a routine sometimes. Uh, you know, out in Florida, being able to you know just them telling you what to do and all that gets a little difficult. Uh, you know, going straight to your room. Um, and it's good to be able to, you know, go to the store here, get what you need and, you know, get around. So that's uh, definitely a plus. Okay. Now you can see Roger that I'm magically outside of my house. Um, <laughs> as, Hey, look, we record this show and sometimes internet comes and goes even in your own house. And so what you do is you go outside where you get better cell service and you can still do the show. So uh, thanks to my friends at Sprint for helping me out with that. Um, you just talked about uh, being back able to drive, Roger. I want to go back into the bubble for a second because you and, and this whole team and, and you got to spend time with Carter Augustine, like probably more time with Carter Augustine in the bubble than you've ever spent in your entire life. What was that experience like for you getting to hang out with this guy, you know, on the Disney complex for that long? Yeah, it was great, actually. I mean, uh, Carter was working his butt off. He was all over the place. He was humid in his camera. One time I saw him by the pool, and I'm like, bro, I think this is the first time I see you. He's like, man, I've been working, editing videos all day, photos. And, um, you know, a lot of the young guys want to see the, their pictures. A lot of the guys in general want to see their pictures and stuff. So he has to imagine that trying to do a million pictures throughout the day and training and stuff, and he's trying to get in. Uh, across to, uh, to the um, Dropbox, whatever you do on our <laughs> on our uh, account. Uh, so that probably it's a lot of job. I mean, if it takes me a long time in my camera. I know he, he's a lot faster than I am, but uh, I don't take as many pictures. But hey, uh, he did a great job. Um, he was he he was working hard. You can see him. Roger, you know, it took so long because Carter was actually photoshopping Mickey Mouse ears on every single person, <laughs> each photo and video. So that's actually that's why guy. it took. That's why it took yeah, that's, that's the guy he didn't like. The guys he liked, he was, he was nice to them. <laughs> but, but Roger, I'm curious. I ran into Roberto Puncic and I was talking to him about the bubble life and being back and what's been the best part about being back home. And he said that when you're down in the bubble, all you can do is think about soccer because you're in your hotel. You, you don't really have that time. Like you had just mentioned getting to drive around and kind of clear your head. What was the hardest part for you from a mental standpoint, staying in the bubble? I said, just being in closed doors in, in my room and being able, uh, you know, they tell you what to do every time and not having control of your life. That makes it a bit difficult. Uh, I said that for the most part, you know, just not being in control of anything. Um, Thanks for the, the kind words, uh, Roger. And <laughs> I will point out that um, Roger was giving me a hard time down there, uh, either saying I'm taking too many photos or I'm not taking enough photos. So it was tough to get the Goldilocks Wait. rate. Uh, yeah. <laughs> how it goes, man. It's how it goes. <laughs> was was yeah. he the one taking all the shirtless pictures of you guys at the pool? Because we got a lot of those on the broadcast, I have to say. Uh, See, I don't know about that. I'm about to sue someone. <laughs> <laughs> That's not, yeah, Graham Hickey is, uh, is not very happy with me in that regard, so we can do that. Um, but you know, you know who is happy, though? Kansas City, because they got right. to see shirtless pictures of Graham Zussi, and everybody else is happy about it. Um, but I, I did, so Nate asked jokingly about your time with me, but I wanted to ask about your time. This is, you know, what was it, 26, 27 days down there with the team. Um, what was that like in terms of uh, camaraderie, getting to know guys perhaps better? Um, I mean, I know you guys had a, a long preseason as well, but this was even longer, it seems. What, what was that aspect of the bubble like? I mean, you know, it, it doesn't change much, you know, from, from uh, being in Arizona in preseason. Uh, you know, we've always been a very tight team. We always hung out together. Uh, you know, obviously this one was a little more just because we couldn't leave much of our, our hallway, but – uh, it was great. Hey, listen, we wanted to win every game. We wish we were still there in the finals. 
uh, once we got there, uh, we didn't care if we stayed there till the end. Uh, obviously, we're, we were very sad that uh, we lost that last game. But once we got home, we were also happy to be here. But absolutely, I mean, it was great to see, you know, where we're at as a team, uh, what we need to improve, uh, especially on the, on the last game where uh, everything happened so quick within the 10 to 20 minute gap. So uh, but as a team, we learned that and we know that, uh, uh, you know, off the field, we get along very well and now we just need to communicate better. But it was great to go down there and, and, and see where we sit as a team after the quarantine. And hopefully now we can bring into season and uh, do a lot better. Cause you got to remember that we're still in first and we still got a lot to fight for. And, and that brings us to this regular season now, and it's been rolled out there the first six games of what they're hoping to be 18 games to close out this regular season. And we, we talked to Amadou Dia last week about this a little bit. You guys still have 10 games before the next, next home game, or, or I'm sorry, the next road game, the next game that you'll play. He said it's, it feels like you've had about six preseasons at this point, what, what's the camp been like or what's training been like coming back from the bubble for a while there? You didn't even know exactly when the season was going to restart. And now that you still got 10 days to get ready for this next game. Absolutely. I agree with Amadou. Uh, and the reason that is, is because you don't know when you, you don't know when you're going to play. Uh, every time you go to practice, you kind of like, you're still working hard. You're still training hard, but you don't know what you're exactly preparing for. You don't know if you go, if you, uh, how fit you have to get and then it comes that hey you're playing so that makes it very difficult but you know the good thing about our team we all have to stay very sharp uh, ready for anything that's coming um we trained for two months before we went to to florida uh i still think we did very well we lost against a great team um and now you know we got back and it's just another little preseason that we have to do before uh this next few games that are coming so we're definitely ready and now we just you know we know it's a date set up and uh it's great to to hear that actually roger these next few games we'll see sporting kansas city back at children's mercy park with a limited number of fans in attendance what was your reaction to finding out that you and the team would get to play back at your home park and and with some fans there uh it's great as long as it's safe uh you know we always said that all, all along and uh, I don't know how many fans is going to be, but I know that the people who's at the stadium are going to be there supporting us. And um, even if there was no fans, you know, we're at our field, uh, a field that we know very well over the years. Uh, but having fans makes it a lot better. Um, and we finally get a, a game at home. Um, and that is great because this is a more serious thing. Now this is season. This is going towards MLS Cup, which is the main goal for this club. You talked about uh, taking some things from, from the bubble and you guys are in first place, obviously, and taking that in the, the rest of the way forward. I want to ask you maybe about a couple players that showed out in the bubble that maybe sporting fans weren't uh, entirely familiar with. And there's some young midfielders, and that's why I want to ask you. Um, we've seen Gianluca Busio, and he, he scored the game-winning penalty against Vancouver. But a couple other guys, Felipe Hernandez and then Cam Duke made his uh, Sporting KC debut. Um, what have you seen from from those two guys this year specifically as they kind of made an impression down there in Orlando? Yeah, it's it's great to see that. You know, at the beginning of the season, uh, preseason down in, in uh, Scottsdale, um, you know, they didn't know what to expect really. And they were six months younger. And that it's a lot to me as, you know, as a player, when you're maturing as a player, I think this quarantine allowed them to be at the same pace, everybody, and they got to see the first two games of the season and saw where they have to be at. Um, and for Bush, who's been coming along uh, and seeing him shoot that PK, that shows you the maturity as a player, um, you know, the having the guts to go there and shoot a PK. I've done it. I've done it here in, like, 2012. I missed. So I know uh, how difficult it is. He did it. Uh, he won the game for us, uh, and that penalty kicked. Um, you know, Cameron Duke is another surprise to me, but uh, he was injured a lot last year, so it was kind of hard to see where he was at. Um, but as you can see, he's a very great player. With Felipe, I've been watching him for the longest time. He reminds me of myself when I was younger a lot. Um, and very humble guy, too. So it's it's great to see him doing well. And uh, they're almost ready. I think they're going to be there um, soon. Uh, same with Jalen. We didn't get to see Jalen. 
just because Zeus runs like a maniac every day. So <laughs> it's kind of hard to see. And oh, another ride back. But uh, Jalen is doing great too. And uh, there's a couple more guys, you know, a trope. Um, and that's the future of this club. Uh, present and future, I would say. And hopefully they can, uh, you know, been able to to take all the pressure and what the expectations of these clubs are. You know, I'm going to have to check with Robo what, what the official word is on Cameron Duke's debut because th those games, the, the knockout round games, don't really count as MLS statistics. True. They're like this – they're not in MLS playoffs. They're not regular season. They're like this unique competition. It's his pro debut. We can at least say that for, for Sporting Kansas City. You said something, though, about Felipe Hernandez that I want to follow up on. You said he reminds me of you a little bit when you were young. Carter and I have talked a lot about watching him over the years – coming up through Swole Park Rangers. And that, that's exactly what we said is, I mean, this guy seems to have that engine that Roger has where he just goes and goes and goes. He's not afraid to get stuck in. He's not as big as you, at least not now. Um, but is that what you're talking about when you say that he reminds you of yourself? And if not, what, what, what did you mean by what he reminds you about yourself? Yeah, absolutely. But 10 times better than me. Uh, he's, he, he might not be my size, but he's, he's a hardworking guy. Obviously, he, he grew up in the academy system, had a had a, a better upbringing than I did in soccer, um, and that's why I think he's he's very good. He reminds you of me, like you said, because he works hard. Uh, you know, he anticipates the ball. He plays a lot with his instinct, and that would, that's what I do as a player. And he gets me in trouble a lot. He's a little bit smarter than that part, uh, but I like that. I like that of him, and I think he's uh, it's a lot better than when I was uh, 21 years old. So uh, yeah. hopefully, um, but the league has also gotten a lot better. So hopefully, he can. He can keep going with that and, you know, just just stay focused on uh, what he has to do on the field. Uh, you know, I'm not saying these guys are ready right now to start, but definitely are, you know, they're ready to get some minutes and whatever the decision the coaching staff makes. I think the, um, they have uh, worked hard and seen what the expectations of the club are. Um, and it's great to see that from these players because the club, um, you know, we all need that. We all need that, uh, you know, guys to step up because – as we know right now, it's only 18 games so far. They say it's going to be right now six games, and uh, everybody's going to be needed, and the young guys are going to bring that energy. Uh, and I think Felipe uh, is one of them. We can see against Salt Lake how he came uh, very good, and um, I like the energy on him. Yeah, you know, it's very difficult to come as a sub and a very, uh, I guess, a rival, I would say, over the years. So that's not easy. Roger, you've been considered – and, and called a, a glue guy of sorts for this team. Whenever new players come in, you're one of the first to help get them acclimated. And so I'm curious, from a mentorship standpoint with some of these younger players, what's that relationship like with them, especially with this young group right now? Uh, what are those conversations like and getting ready for those pro moments? Yeah, absolutely. I mean, the guys here, uh, not just me, from all the other older guys, they get to see it every day when we train. Um, obviously, if they're my team, I always want to help them. I yell them a little bit. If they're against me, I want to kick them. So they can see that part, too, that that happens in the game. No, but, you know, I, I'm excited. I'm excited. Uh, you know, they don't really ask many questions, but they do listen a lot. They do listen a lot in the field and the tactical way we try to play as a team. Uh, it's great that they come from the academy, so they really understand what's going on around. So, um, you know, it's I think they just follow what the rest of the guys are doing. And uh, as a club for the other guys, the expectations, we know what it is, the club. Um, you know, sometimes I think it goes well as we plan, but uh, the expectations are always there, and I think they see that at a very young age. All right, back to the to the restart. Um, as you said, safety and health will be a big focus for everyone involved, and kind of as a um, as a symptom of that, the schedule coming out. You guys are playing kind of a regional schedule against um, Minnesota, Houston, Colorado. I'm wondering, are you going to get sick of seeing Minnesota, Houston, and Colorado this season? Or, or uh, what, what do you think of just this first phase uh, of getting back into the regular season and the, the opponents starting uh, with Minnesota? Uh, to me, it doesn't matter who the opponent is. Uh, you know, it's uh, always tough games. Uh, Minnesota, uh, over the years, have become uh, a great team, obviously, at the beginning, just because they were a new team into this league. Uh, not everybody starts like Atlanta, but... Uh, uh, Minnesota is definitely a tough team uh, we have to face again. Um, I'm sure they want to play us, and we want to play them. Uh, you know, Colorado is another tough game that we played over there. Uh, Houston and Dallas, those are not easy teams to play. But to me, it doesn't matter. You know, I just want to win the 
the group if you call the group and and uh finish first well hey roger we really appreciate the time welcome back to kansas city welcome to your sixth preseason of the year or whatever it is now <laughs> and uh and hopefully uh we'll, we'll you know we'll not hopefully, we're, we're excited to see you back on the field at Children's Mercy Park coming up in, uh, in a couple of weeks. Thanks for joining us. Sound, sounds good. Thank you, guys. All right, that's Roger Espinoza. We'll be back to wrap things up on this edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show right after this. And we're back to wrap things up on this edition of the Sporting Kansas City Show presented by Michelob Ultra, Nate Bucati, Ali Trost, Carter Augustine with you. And, guys, as we mentioned, this is, uh, this is taking place as the MLS is back tournament is wrapping up. But uh, I don't know about you, Carter and Allie, but I, I got a ballot in the mail, in the email version of a ballot for uh, some awards for this MLS's back tournament. And I was spending some time trying to think about um, who I had winning the MLS player of the tournament, the goalkeeper of the tournament, things like that. And um, I'm kind of curious to get your thoughts on it. When it comes to the player of the competition, there have been some, some guys that I thought I had in first place as, you know, as, as the competition went on. But I got to be honest, after the semifinals, I went with Nani. I thought the performance he had delivering Orlando City to the finals was incredible. Uh, exactly the type of performance that you want from a designated player when he comes in. So he got my vote. Curious what you guys thought. Who'd you have? Is, uh, obviously, it could change a lot based on what happens in tonight's game. But going into this, who do you have as your MVP? Yeah, I didn't get this ballot, but I mean, I'm with you, Nani. Jenny Chu, who covers uh, Orlando down in Florida, said before the tournament, like, that was her pick. She was like, look out, because Nani's about to have uh, a great run here, and he absolutely has. But I've also been, I think Chris Mueller's done a great job as well. I think he's been, you know, I just think this entire Orlando team um, totally surprised people, including myself, you know everyone kind of had a rooted interest in some way, shape or form. It's in Orlando. It's kind of the Cinderella story, if you will, haha ha, Disney, but it's like, Oh, it would be really cool if Orlando could win this in uh, their city. But I just think that the players have absolutely um, rose to the occasion and have looked phenomenal. So my two picks would be Nani or Chris Mueller. Yeah. Um, I think it'd be tough to go away from, from Nani with them getting to the, to the final. And, you know, I say that begrudgingly as a Liverpool fan, <laughs> um, but he's been fantastic. To you have to give him credit, and that's a great shout on Chris Mueller as well. They they've definitely been the surprises of the tournament. You know, Peter Vermees said he thought they would have an advantage having been in Orlando for this whole time, and uh, maybe that's been a part of it. Maybe it's been the Disney magic, but they seem to come up with the moments um, when, when they needed the most. Um, I, I'm really sad that Io Akinola was hurt in the in the Toronto uh, knockout game because I would have loved to see him. Um, try and continue his phenomenal form that he had in the group stages. For me, I think he was the standout of the group stage, but didn't quite make it far enough to, to get to MVP status. So, yeah, I, I probably have to make it a unanimous uh, uh, Orlando with, with Nani. So I'm glad you brought up Io Akinola, though, Carter, because another one of the um, one awards that they had us voting on was young player of the competition. And I think there's some great ones. I mean, Mueller, I think you could put in that category if, if, if you consider him a young player in that, in that same mode. I think Jeremy Abobasi probably is going to get a lot of votes, what he's done with Portland. There have been some great candidates out there. But I actually went with Akinola. And, and I, maybe that's wrong because maybe, you know, you, you should vote for somebody who's made it a little bit deeper. But I'm with you, Carter, in terms of when he played, I thought he was the player that stood out the most to me. And, and that was what I voted it on. I'm curious what you guys uh, would say in – in that regard. I think that this tournament as a whole was so great for a lot of the young players really getting to mm -hmm. showcase their skills. Uh, and unfortunately I have to look at Philadelphia. So Aronson and Mark McKenzie to me were, were two players, two young, young players who, who really made a name for themselves in this MLS's back tournament, even before then, but Philadelphia has got a good thing uh, up East there. Yeah, those are great shouts. Um, I think you have to toss in Hasseld from Vancouver just off of, I mean, oh my gosh! <laughs> just the circumstances around the whole thing, and and how well he played in that uh, round of 16 game against Sporting. But yeah, I'm going to uh, I'm going to go with uh, Akinola, and I think all U.S. fans will be keeping a couple eyes on on this guy. Um, seems like he's uh, opened his recruitment a little bit, and you, you can't really blame him for that. He's got triple eligibility with Canada and Nigeria as well. And I know he's played for the U S 
youth teams growing up. And um, it was interesting hearing from Greg Berhalter at, during the tournament saying, hey, we, you know, we just hope that the connections that we've built over time are, are uh, speak to what we see in him and, and what he could be with the U.S. program. Um, but he had big shoes to fill with Josie Altador being out for the majority of the tournament. And, man, did he fill them. He was, he was incredible. So I'm going to go with him just over uh, uh, Aronson, who, who was – uh, I think has earned a, a big money move here in the near future. We're going we're gonna to see some big money moves from some MLS players going forward. And I think that's a positive thing. I think that that momentum from, you know, what we saw uh, from Alfonso Davies and other players like that going over and having success in Europe is just going to keep that going. And I, again, I'm glad that MLS has started to embrace that a little bit to realize that's a big part of actually growing as a part of, of a league that is considered to be, ter- you know, one that you want to watch for young talent. And, mm-hmm. uh, and, and also a place that young talent wants to come and, and, and grow as players because we get to enjoy that young, exciting talent. And I'm one that's, hey, look, as great as Nani has been, watching young, exciting players on the come up is fun in soccer. Youth is valuable in the sport of soccer um, at the time. It, not just like, hey, I'm going to dream on this kid five years from now. We get to watch Aronson do some pretty special stuff right now as a player. And, uh, and I think that's going to continue. So that's a positive. Then when it comes to the goalkeeper of the competition, uh, I went with Andre Blake. I thought I, I really I know that you you continue to evaluate things as the competition goes on, but I do think the group stage games matter. And that guy was just incredible in every single match that I watched of his. He stands out to me over anybody else. So that's who I voted for. Uh, Ali, who would you uh, got anybody that stands out for you in that regard? I'm with you. It's so hard because, you know, you, you have to look at the entirety of the tournament, uh, maybe not just the teams that advance, but the, the moment, the goalkeeping moment. And, and I would say that Andre Blake had the best overall performance of the tournament, but I just keep looking at Tim Melia's PK showing in that, uh, in that stage to uh, advance Sporting Kansas City. And that, to me, stood out as the best goalkeeping moment of the tournament. Maybe not the best overall performance, but the best moment, I would say, goes to Tim Melia there. It's a good shout for Tim. Um, if, if we're going to go best save, I think Andre Blake might have had it in that first game. I mean, the one where he dove to his left and just oh got my, yeah. just like the shades of his, of his fingernails on it, and it, it was able to put it around the post. It wound up being a huge save. Um, so I, And, yeah, I, I'll go with Blake for, for goalkeeper of the tournament as well. So there you go. It's going to be – and, by the way, Alan Polito is up for best 11 as well. So he's been nominated for that. We'll see where he goes from there. And now, guys, it's on to the MLS is back season. Part two is back again. Whatever we're going to call it, we have soccer in our home markets coming up. Six games announced. It's going to be a lot of fun. And, uh, you know, next week we'll be getting ready for game week on Friday uh, against Minnesota United. So it's going to do it, guys. I I meant it, though, when I said in our interview with Sam, like, I want some Backstreet Boys, like, MLS is back. Back again. I don't know. That's, I, that's I, I Eminem. White jumpsuits. Eminem. What, whoever sings it. I need an early 2000s pop music video. I need like who like the top personalities in Major League Soccer. Throw them in there. It's a missed opportunity if they don't take it. This is hard. I don't know. What, what do you do with this Ali Trost character right now? We, Backstreet Boys I mean, and Eminem being confused for one another has never happened before in my life. That's the first. But, uh, yeah. Mash like, the two together. I just pictured the, like this though. That's bye bye. Back streets bye. back. That's back, bye bye bye. But we're back back back. <laughs> Again. Lots to unpack there. Uh, <laughs> hopefully Marshall Mathers doesn't see the, see these tapes. I know he's a big fan right. of this show, so maybe he'll just. Yeah. Miss it. I don't know. But, uh, Ooh, I'm sweating. I would I name the, a back. I don't know about you guys, but I love that trophy. I don't know. I think I it's really too. cool. I do wish that they made an an alternate with some sort of Disney tie, like whether it's the castle, not as like trophies. Yeah. 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 But it is very, it's a beautiful trophy. Hey, and as we said, it's a trophy to me that doesn't deserve an asterisk by it. It deserves a gold star because um, whoever wins this thing, whether it's Orlando or Portland, you you deserve credit for for going into that bubble and surviving a unique set of circumstances all the way to the end and, and winning this thing. So, props to whichever team ends up lifting that trophy they deserve a special one and and if, mm-hmm. if sporting had won it i would have been all for painting the wall where, where you put a new column in there whatever you do that trophy belongs in the case just like all the rest of them 
uh, pretty cool stuff. But there is going to be a trophy to go for here uh, with the regular season and playoffs coming up. So that's going to do it for us this time around, guys. For Sam Stagecoat, Roger Espinoza, Ali Trost, Carter Augustine, this is Nate Bucati saying thanks for watching. And thanks to Michelob Ultra for providing the content again this week. We'll see you next Tuesday as we get ready for Sporting KC and Minnesota United. So long, everybody.